Yeah, so after, afternoon, everybody. So we've had the introduction, so I won't introduce myself. I'll hand straight over to Laura. Um, thank, thanks, thanks, everybody. So um, I'm just going to say a few words about UCL Partners. Um, so UCL Partners is an academic health science partnership. Um, we, um, our work is really around how do we accelerate innovation and research into practice for better out patient outcomes as quickly as possible. Um, but I just say a note, we're, we, we're based in London and we cover North Central, North East London and parts of Essex. Um, but we're one of 15 academic health science networks across the country, so you might be familiar with the Greater Manchester HSN. So you might say, well, what, what are you doing um, up here today? Well, we're here to really um, share some work that we started during COVID, which has since um, been taken up nationally. Um, so I'll hand it to Matt just to set the scene for that. Great, thanks, Laura. So, so we're going to talk about prevention, heart attacks, strokes, prevention of heart attacks and strokes. Um, which is huge, and we know how serious and how devastating strokes and heart attacks can be, and, um, um, but also how they're highly preventable. So many of you in the audience will have seen this sort of slide. It just summarises how huge a problem heart attacks, strokes, cardiovascular disease is for the country, just the sheer contribution to premature deaths, so it counts about a quarter of all deaths, a quarter of all premature deaths, and lots and lots of admissions, huge amounts of health care and social care expenditure. We know all of that. But it's the balloon on the right I'm always really interested in emphasising that the major contribution that strokes and heart attacks plays um, to uh, accounts for health inequalities, um, accounting for about a fifth of the life expectancy gap between most affluent and most deprived. So it's huge. And it's hugely preventable, and of course we all know that. And it's preventable through, of course, the lifestyles we lead, and obesity and exercise and diet and smoking and alcohol and all of that. We know that's probably the most important thing one can do in the long term to prevent strokes and heart attacks. But what we're focusing on, what we focused on in our work in New South Partners is the bit of that that we do in the NHS that we don't do very well, that we could do much better at, and this slide shows data from the global burden of disease. Again, many of you will have seen this sort of picture. I hope you can read the slides from the distance, but it basically lists the top 10 causes of premature death and disability in England, um, pretty similar to across the world, to be honest. But you can see within that blood glucose, that's diabetes, blood pressure, and LDL is the bad cholesterol. Um, and, of course, atrial fibrillation, we know, is a major cause of stroke. So those are all important because they are major causes of heart attack and stroke, but they're all very treatable. And if you treat blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, there's a straight line of evidence between you treat and you prevent these uh, catastrophic events in people's lives. But despite that, we know that under-treatment is very common and under-diagnosis is very common. And so that's where we focused our work. Um, um, in trying to understand that is, and therefore what you can do about it, I think historically we've had this assumption, we were talking with Asim over lunch, that there's this magic black box of stuff that happens in primary care, that we just get all the evidence to primary care and then the good stuff will happen. But of course we know the real world's not like that. And actually the poor performance in blood pressure and lipid management, atrial fibrillation management, is decades old. It's moved very little, despite COF and NICE and CQC and everything else. We've seen very little improvement over time. So our work has been focused on understanding, so why is that? Actually, if we do more of the same, we're going to get more of the same. How can we, by understanding what happens in primary care, do things differently? So we have this historical challenge, late diagnosis, under-treatment, widespread unwarranted variation, as the scene was pointing out earlier. Um, but it's not because we wake up in the morning to do a bad job in general practice, it's because it's really hard to do this apparently simple stuff in the real world. Because we have 10 minutes or 8 minutes if we're lucky in consultations, most of our patients are complex, most have multimorbidity. Many a time I have not measured the blood pressure or felt the pulse when I know I should have done, because it's just way down the, the long list of priorities for the patient and for me. That's the real world. Um, and of course we're always overwhelmed, and then we have the pandemic on top of all of that. So unless we acknowledge that this is really hard to do, we ain't going to make any progress. We'll just repeat the decades-long 
maybe slightly incremental progress um, in each of these conditions. So in New Cell Partners, really in the first, second day of the first lockdown, we focused on how can we build something that will support primary care to do things differently? As we're hitting this really terrible time, we didn't know how bad it was going to be then, but a time when everything had to change and GPs were suddenly up for change. So our question was, what can we, how can we support primary care to enable a step change, a big change in prevention of heart attacks and strokes? And to do that, firstly, mobilise data, get good data to tell us where we should be focusing. Secondly, get much better by using the wider workforce at, at systematically delivering proactive care for our patients. And through that, support GPs, capacity, workflow, etc. So the key components, the three key components of UCL Partners frameworks, and if you Google UCL Partners Proactive Care, you'll see the wealth of resources that we now have there. But the three core components was smart use of data, so you can identify your population, risk stratify, and prioritise those with the high impact conditions. Um, secondly, use the wider staff. We have these ARS roles in primary care now, funded additional roles who do all sorts of bits of things to support general practice. Well, our question was, how can we systematise what they do to take on the stuff that we as doctors and nurses do badly? So support for education, self-management, behaviour change. Let's systematise how this group of staff could support patients in that way. And then structured implementation of support. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So broadly, the frameworks look like this for each condition. In the centre there, you've got the conditions. And I've put on there some of the criteria for stratification. So for atrial fibrillation, if you're not an anticoagulant, it's a high priority. If you're on a combination of drugs that makes you more likely to have bleeding episodes, you're high priority, etc. If you've got high blood pressure, you can stratify according to the latest blood pressure reading. And the same with cholesterol. We built comprehensive search tools for EMIS and System 1, so it becomes dead easy to prioritise in that way. That feeds into the lower box of a, of a clinician optimising care in the patient, who's not just slavishly following the way we've historically done it of you call people in on the anniversary of their last visit or on their birthday month or something. Actually do it by clinical priority. So we focus right in on those patients who are not an anticoagulant, whose blood pressure is poorly controlled, etc. But the upper box is where much of this innovation came, using these wider staff, training them, providing resources so that they can deliver structured support for education, self-management and behaviour change. And this next slide illustrates that in a little bit more detail. So we've taken high, high blood pressure here as an example. Hypertension is one of the major causes of stroke and, and heart attack that's highly preventable. Um, the key things for your patient with hypertension listed at the top, it's not just their blood pressure, but have you checked for atrial fibrillation? Have you optimised their lipid therapy? If they've got chronic kidney disease, are you optimising that? Because those are all the things in a patient with hypertension that will drive the risk of stroke, the risk of heart, heart attack. So on the left there, clinical optimization. I won't rehearse that, but you know that's what we should be doing. Deal with comorbidities, assess risk, optimize treatment. But again, the innovative bit on the right there, using those staff. So helping patients with, under, with education, using the fantastic stuff that's available, available on the Stroke Association website, British Heart Foundation website. What is blood pressure? What is atrial fibrillation? What's cholesterol? Why does it matter? What can I do myself? All really important things for patients, but how often do we do that in our consultations? Helping a patient to know where to buy an affordable and valid blood pressure machine and how to take their blood pressure and know it's accurate, what to do if they think their pulse is irregular, etc. Along with education, brief intervention on smoking, physical activity, um, um, uh, alcohol, etc. So, as you can see, it's a sort of approach to systematizing it helping people to understand what it is we can do in a different way. And we'll come on to talk about our focus has very much been on the how, not just reiterating what it is. We're really good at that. In general practice in secondary care, just reiterating, what does the guidance say? Get on and do it, guys. Actually, that's not the problem. It's the how. So all of our guidance has been focused on the how. And this is just to illustrate one of the reasons this has landed so well in GP land. A, they can see it's been developed by primary care people. But also, look at this, how this helps you with workflow planning. So we know that about half of our patients with hypertension are not well controlled. 
that's a huge number of people. Actually, what the stratification shows you is that there's 18% at the top who are really high risk, and you need to focus there first. So I no longer need to worry about my backlog. I can safely stratify, safely get my pharmacists or nurses to focus on these highest risk patients. So that lands very well because it helps us meet COAF targets, but helps us manage our capacity very importantly. And then just some numbers to illustrate the, the impact, we'll talk about rollout and spread, but in, these are the sort of numbers we've had back in case studies, and they're huge. If you stratify in this way, this is what you can do. So just in this one PCN, Havery North in North London, a thousand additional patients treated to target. Um, that will prevent a potentially um, 10 heart attacks or strokes um, in the next three years, just doing that. The second one, even more impressive, 300 patients with AF, not on anticoagulants, started anticoagulants. That will prevent something like 15 strokes in 18 months. 400 patients who have both atrial fibrillation and cardiovascular disease put on a statin. That'll prevent, my math is struggling, but something like 40 heart attacks for strokes in five years in one, in, in one small area in North London. So the numbers are huge. And, and then the, the Surrey Heartlands, almost 9,000 people had their blood pressure treated to target. So this is no longer incremental. This is transformational change. This is step change. And we should be demanding step change. We we've, we've tolerate suboptimal treatment in general practice because that's how it is. I think we should be challenge, challenging that. So I'll hand over to Laura now. Thank you. And um, we've got a bit of a double act um, going on, but hopefully seamless. So I'm just going to say a few words about um, the national spread and then um, spend a bit of time talking around the implementation support and why we have really kept the, the implementation pieces central um, to the frameworks. So we were, I think, genuinely surprised about the um, engagement and support um, for this approach right from the start of COVID. So we had lots of GPs, primary care colleagues coming together for evening seminars, straight in their um, protective equipment. Um, but that really helped shape um, both the framework and the approach and the content that, that's um, included in them. So we've had more than 16,000 downloads of the Practicare frameworks. And if you visit the UCL Partners website, you'll see um, they're freely available and you can access um, all the frameworks and they're there for seven different conditions. We've um, been uh, recognised through some national awards, um, but the frameworks are also um, integrated with Arden, so if you're familiar with that GP system, you can access the frameworks through that. But for the last financial year, they were also part of a national blood pressure programme. So I mentioned the academic health science networks at the start, and all 15 HSNs supported spread um, of the hypertension framework, really thinking around how can we systematically optimise patients um, across the country. So Manchester was involved in that, and we've just uh, published a blood pressure optimisation impact report. There's a case study for every region. There's one for Manchester. I think ASIM is also... Um, uh, uh, profiled in, in there, so please do take a look. Um, but what we've been delighted is that more than uh, 600 PCNs are now utilising this framework approach, which is just after under half of all PCNs in the country. The blood pressure optimisation programme um, is continuing, um, supported by the HSNs across the country, and it's got the three priorities, one around optimisation, a second around case finding, and a third around inequalities. And to support um, local systems think about the inequalities, we provided data to them around which practices in their area had the lowest um, treatment to target rates and which of their practices are in the lowest um, uh, the most deprived areas um, of their geography, so that they could really focus ac activity um, on those populations that we thought um, would benefit most from the programme. So a little bit about uptake. Um, but what we've always kept as central to this approach is um, that how-to. So we can give people data, we can give people gadgets, um, we can give them uh, new technology, um, but we know people are under pressure and busy. And to be able to make change can take time, can take um, rethinking of systems, can think around patient pathways, around how we involve patients in a new way. So there's a plethora of activity that needs to take place to make change happen. So because of that, we've always said, A, um, the frameworks are not a blueprint. They're there to be adapted. They're there to be taken locally, pulled apart, put back together, um, and reflected depending on local preference, local pathways, local staff that are available. Um, but we've also made space for that implementation support. So if you look at the frameworks, you'll find 
Um, there is the search and stratification, but there's also suggested activities um, or interventions that could be undertaken for each patient cohort. There are recommended digital tools to support patients with self-management, but also to support the wider workforce. Um, and there's also uh, support for workforce as well. So uh, many of the early PCNs worked with said, well, we don't really know where to start. We've got some HCAs here. We're about to uh, recruit some care coordinators, but can you help us think through what are the training needs that they might have and how we fill them? So again, as you work through the frameworks, you'll be able to see we've provided examples of, of what, of what um, activity, what uh, training might be needed. Um, and why have we done this? Well, really that recognition around implementation. So for those of you who've seen the Fuller report, there's a real emphasis on that local ownership and giving people the space to be able to, uh, to make change happen. And without that local ownership and clinical leadership, um, she highlighted the fact that change just doesn't happen. But there's also that need for back-end support, for implementation support to make things happen. So the next few slides really just screen grabs of some of the support that's available. And you can see it all um, on the UCL Partners website. But here are screen grabs of what the frameworks look like. Um, there's a wealth of information sitting under each of these. There's a, it's, the navigation is not, it's not the best at the moment, but you can navigate to the search and stratification tools, the education training, um, digital resources. There's some fantastic case studies drawn from across the country. Um, and this is an example of our updated proactive care consultation, which is around how to talk to patients, not just about the specific condition, but about their wider health. And we developed this because of direct patient feedback saying, please talk to us you know, in our wider sense, not just about our blood pressure or our diabetes. Um, yeah, so just final screen grabs. So what have we learned? What's important about um, spreading innovation? One is around engagement. I don't think we can ever have enough conversations about this approach. I think this is something that Asim uh, mentioned um, at lunchtime around constantly talking to people, um, no matter where they're placed um, within your locality, from you know, that senior lead to GP working day in, day out, um, to the operational manager who ultimately will probably help make some of this happen. There's just not enough engagement you can do. Second is that real focus on workforce, so how do we support um, the breadth of primary care workforce to play a really vital role in delivering care, and I'm hopeful I brought to life some of the support that we gave. And then thirdly, um, where we found sites and ICSs that have really been able to drive this forward is that enabling environment. So there's a lovely case study in the BPO impact report from Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland, where they really aligned their governance, their strategic programmes, um, their incentives all around um, blood pressure optimisation. And of course, all underpinned by data. So we don't know, we can't manage what we don't know. Um, so that's why we kind of uh, started with that um, as, the, as the heart of the um, frameworks. An, an agile approach to project management, reflecting local interests and, and local priorities, um, and ultimately collaboration. So I'll hand back to Matt. Thanks, Laura. So um, this slide you may have seen, this is um, size of the prize that we developed First, a few years ago, when I was a national clinical director, a one side of A4 that tells a story. This is sort of updated. This is just for blood pressure. This is for Greater Manchester. Um, and what it shows is that the percentage of patients with hypertension whose blood pressure is treated to target. Um, and on the left, I'm trying to work out which way you're looking. Yeah, it is on the left for all of us. On the left, the, the peak there is how well we were doing before COVID, and actually 70%, a third of patients with hypertension were not treated to target. This is the historical gap, and we accepted this as, as acceptable and uh, tolerable. I, as I say, I think we should really challenge that now, but look what happened one year into COVID, dropped to under 50%, and we saw that pretty well much the whole, across the whole country, and not surprisingly, we were all on our knees, weren't we, in, in, in the NHS. Um, but look how slow the recovery has been since then. So 62.8% is the picture last December. We'll shortly have the March data from CVD Prevent. But that's 21 months after the dip. We'd only got up from 50% you know, to 60-odd percent. Um, the first position after that recovery is getting back to where we were before, so 70.9%. And of course, that, that was everyone's ambition. Everyone said, we've got to recover, we've got to recover. What we've done with size of the prize is to say recovery is not enough. We need ambitions beyond that. So you then see a trajectory of ambitions up to 80% optimization rates. Underneath that, it shows the number of heart attacks and strokes that would be prevented and the money saved if we reach that level. 
you could turn that around and say, well, we're on 62.8% in Greater Manchester now. If we don't get up to 709 in three years, that's going to, I can't quite read all the numbers, in three years we're going to have an additional 400 strokes and heart attacks just because we don't get back to that original position, which will cost a huge amount of money in NHS and social care resources, of course, but impact for individuals is, is beyond description. So that's what's going to happen if we don't get to that recovery position. But if we turn it around again, if we get to that recovery position and move beyond that up to 80%, then we'll be looking at preventing hundreds, hundreds of strokes and heart attacks across Greater Manchester in three years and every three years. I think this is the real challenge for us that we should rise to because it's highly doable. These are not unrealistic ambitions, but they've felt unrealistic in the past. Um, and this just, you won't be able to see the detail in here, but this is every PCN in Greater Manchester showing the green, the green bars is the percentage of patients with hypertension treated to target. The darker colour bars in rank order show how much improvement there has been in that 21 month period. And you can see that some PCMs at the top have done really well. They've had about a 30% improvement to the bottom where there's been no improvement at all in that 21 months. That's not to lay blame. There are all sorts of reasons why some areas, geographies, practices struggle. But what it tells us is there's a huge opportunity and a huge need for support to, do some, to make things happen. Just at a glance, this is the size of the prize for cholesterol. We've only got it for one PCN on the website. But if you Google UCL partner size of the prize, you'll find the blood pressure one for every ICS and region in the country. We are developing a cholesterol one which, for every ICS, which will be out within a few weeks. But this just shows what we expect to see everywhere. If you look at that top line, that's the percentage of patients who've already had a stroke or heart attack who are on, who are on statins. And you can see about 20% are not on statins, which is awful, isn't it? These are life-saving drugs. But look at the numbers. If we were to get even just reasonable ambitions, if we were to increase from 80% to 90% of those patients with CVD on a statin, we'd prevent 546 events in that one ICB area in five years, 100 a year. Just the enormity of it is quite staggering, isn't it? From very basic treatments that we know, we know work. So this is not meant to be a tirade, but it tells us the opportunity. It's meant to really hit us between the eyes, I think, about the opportunity to do things differently, which is where all of our work is focused. We don't have one for atrial fibrillation because the numbers are so much smaller. You just don't get that, don't get that scale. I'd just like to finish by talking about CVD action, um, which we've developed as a sort of a, an evolution from the proactive care frameworks that sit with the proactive care frameworks, but this is a much more sophisticated tool that we've developed. We're piloting now in London and two or three sites around the country, and we're expecting it to be available for general rollout next uh, April when we've got some evaluation evidence. But it is very much trying to use smart data that's focused on patients, not individual conditions. So this takes routinely held GP data. You run searches in the practices. It's about 85 searches, which are worse than useless to a GP. How could you wade through lots of searches? But what they do is they integrate those into a, a dashboard, so you get a, an overall picture. They're the key conditions on the right there, the six high-risk conditions that cause CVD. Um, they mirror CVD prevent, so it's one version of the truth. But it gives you patient identifiable data in your practice. So it basically identifies the patients who are suboptimally managed. Um, um, but it also captures multiple risk factors in individual patients, and I'll show you that in a moment. You can also filter, so you can take a health inequalities lens. So filter by severe mental illness or ethnicity or deprivation, for example. So we've built the tool, it's designed to be really easy to use and appealing to general practice. Avoiding the trap we often fall into in public health of sharing lots of data that's really comprehensive, but it's just really hard to, to turn into something actionable on the ground. So the, very, the focus is very much on actionable data. I'm not going to do any detail, but we will be sharing the slides. Um, this is the home page, which shows you the six conditions. Each of the green bars are not individual indicators, but groups of indicators. So you can see at a glance, in my practice, roughly how many patients' blood pressure is not optimised, for example. That's the home page. You'd click along the top to, to get to individual condition pages. This is the hypertension page. But what we've done here for each condition is that there are three or four domains that bring in the multimorbidity. So 
if our patients with hypertension, we want to know the numbers of people whose blood pressure is not treated to target. That's the top left panel. And it stratifies them into four groups. So we start at the top and work down, and that's the clinical priority. But it also tells us, in my practice, who my patients are with hypertension and CVD who are not on statins, or who are on statins but not the right dose or intensity, or they're on the maximum dose but they're not treated to target, because all of these patients can have more treatment to reduce their risk of stroke and heart attack. There's one for AF detection, so have you checked your pulse rhythm in your patients in, with hypertension in the last year to see if they have atrial fibrillation, and there's one around CKD management. So across all six conditions, that's the approach we take. The index condition, is it, sub, is it managed optimally? And if not, who are the patients? And then the other causes of CVD that that patient might have. I'm sure you won't be able to see detail here, but what it illustrates is that you, you just click on any of these bars and it gives you a drop down at the bottom, which is your list of patients. This is all false dummy data, by the way. But So we click on those top two bars of blood pressure not controlled to target, and I've got my list of 46 patients who the nurse or pharmacist needs to bring in quickly to optimise. So it makes it very... Uh, very uh, usable. Um, you click on multiple panels. You, you click on those two hypertension ones and you could pick up the highest risk um, CVD one as well, for example. And this slide is highlighting the health and the quality dimension. So by clicking on the blood pressure bars and the demographics bar, you can see highlighted at the bottom, that's patients with severe mental illness. So I can just pull out my patients with SMI whose blood pressure is not treated target. Because people with severe mental illness die on average 15 to 20 years before the rest of us. And they die not from their SMI, they die from cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart attack, or cancer, or COPD. So it allows us to focus right in on that high group, high risk group of patients. And you can see with atrial fibrillation, it's the same approach. It's not just, are they on anticoagulants, but is their blood pressure managed? Are they on appropriate therapy for their CVD, etc.? And then, uh, these are the four other um, disease areas you can just see from the picture that it uh, looks the same. So Laura's just going to talk about how we're piloting this now. Um, so we have a, a pilot underway in London. So we're working with up to 10 PCNs across the five ICSs across London. There are also three sites outside of London. The closest to here is West Yorkshire, but I think they're still selecting which PCNs will take part. So this is really to test is CBD action acceptable um, and feasible to use um, by primary care teams? Um, but also, can we see early indications that it's delivering better, uh, different better outcomes for patients as looked at, at numbers of patients treated to target? Um, but going back to my earlier point around not just kind of launching tools and dashboards um, out to colleagues and expecting them to be taken up, we are placing, a, again, a kind of a, a big focus on implementation and supporting those local systems to be able to um, implement pathways to um, uh, identify local leads who want to drive forward this programme. So the, the, the kind of offer um, from UCL Partners is around utilisation of the dashboard, is support for facilitation to help um, understand the outputs um, of the dashboard and to think around what support is needed in terms of seeing um, and managing those patients. There's also additional funding for people with lived experience so that we can assure in those PCNs where it's being piloted, we're really getting to the heart of some of the inequalities um, within those areas to understand well, why people aren't or are accessing their local health services and, and what are some of those perceptions around blood pressure and cholesterol and so on that might stop um, access and um, uh, interaction with their local healthcare team. So we're hoping by April next year we should have some early interim findings um, and our, our hope is that from next financial year CBD Action will be widely and freely available to all NHS users. Thank you. So I'm just going to finish by uh, not, not do detail on these slides but just to remind ourselves of the size of the prize for Greater Manchester and the starting point is that um, CBD is very preventable. Not just the longer term lifestyle stuff but the stuff we do at bread and butter work in, in general practice. Secondly, it's difficult to do in general practice. It's a challenge. Um, and if we want to shift the dial in CVD prevention, we'll only do it by supporting primary care to do things differently, not just reiterating what we've reiterated for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and so transforming CVD prevention in primary care, use smart data, use your wider workforce um, uh, to optimise, but in clinical priority order, and use your broader workforce to support education, self-management, behaviour change. So 
is more of a partnership with, with patients. Um, and then CVD Action is all about enabling this primary care transformation. It's not just giving a smart tool, it's all the information, inflammation transformation support that is necessary. It's clear, fuller report houses. Um, ambitions just will not be delivered in primary care unless there's the infrastructure and resources to, to make them happen in, in the real world. But here's the bottom line. So if we optimise blood pressure, to, it, 80% of patients with hypertension in Greater Manchester treated to target will prevent um, just about a thousand heart attacks and strokes in three years. If we get 90% of patients from 80 to 90% of patients on, with CVD onto statins, we'll prevent another 700 strokes and heart attacks in three years. So it's a huge number in a small time frame, and I think it has to be a call, a call to action. But we won't do it just by calling for action. We have to have a structured, systematic approach to how do we support primary care to make this make this happen. So. Um, so thanks very much, Lisa. I think we'll take questions, but I, I think I going to come and talk first. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm grateful to be followed by uh, to follow Dr. Kearney and, and uh, Dr. Boyd. Thank you very much. We didn't see each other's slides before today, but I think they go together quite well. So, so hopefully um, everything will all make sense. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, all of the work discussed today, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to contribute. Um, there are a lot of organisations that fall within Greater Manchester and the GM system, and some of what I will be presenting has been the result of many of them, an amazing dedication from so many individuals. Um, none of this would have been possible without the Stroke Network and Sarah's excellent leadership, uh, so thank you. <laughs> You'll just see the Greater Manchester ICS logo on all of these slides, because I prefer to think of us as one happy family. Um, okay, so we've got a mix of people in the room today, so I'm going to try and take it all the way back and help share some of my understanding of what cardiovascular disease means and what CVD prevention really means. Um, I know we've got members of the public here as well, and we talk about cardiovascular disease a lot, um, but really it means anything that affects blood vessels, and they are all over the body. So really we're talking about people, and they range from high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, through to those um, which we call the high-risk conditions, and we know that they're often also related to lifestyle factors, um, such as diet, smoking, physical activity, weight, and the lifestyle factors are themselves associated with wider demographic factors such as education, employment, social support and deprivation. Um, I think it's important because as Dr. Kearney was suggesting, there are some clear things and actions that all of us can do wherever we are. Um, and so this is really about all of us working together. Um, as I've been doing this role for the last year or so, I've come to realize that prevention means different things to different people. Um, it's quite uh, lots of definitions for that word. Um, while lots of things are achievable, um, there is so much more we can do, I think, with what we already have. And in my opinion, the big wins will really be from doing more with less by going back to the basics and getting them right. In its widest sense, CVD prevention encompasses consideration of all of these things from the previous slide and essentially means keeping people healthy and well. Um, Dr. Kearney mentioned the Global Burden of Disease report. Um, this is a slide taken from that report showing how everyone, the cause of death of everyone in Greater Manchester in 2019. And you can see cardiovascular disease is this bit here. But of course, the underlying factors that led to this are also implicated in the rest. Um, the long-term plan has suggested that cardiovascular disease is the single thing and the way that the NHS can save lives over the next 10 years. Um, of course, that was before COVID. Um, life expectancy has dropped. Uh, the largest since 1981 or World War II, depending on your source, um, during COVID. 
minority ethnic groups, people with cardiovascular disease and high-risk conditions such as obesity, hypertension, contributed to over 75% of the deaths from COVID-19. So reducing the prevalence of CVDs and comorbidities is therefore in itself an important part of mitigating against the future adverse health impacts of living with COVID. I took this slide from Chris Whitty. Um, COVID-19 has not only highlighted but exacerbated inequalities. A map of child mortality from 1851 bear striking similarities to a map of COVID-19 mortality rates, which is all basically the same as a map of prevalence of CVD or following socioeconomic gradients. Um, indeed, what we are trying to do has been going on for a long time um, and will require us to work and think differently going forwards. Um, I think it's what you were referring to, Dr. Kearney, that there's no magic bullet no quick fix to this. Um, this has been going on for a very long time, and if we want things to change, we have to change and, and do things differently. Um, CVD is intimately linked with health inequalities. In GM, the most deprived are up to four times more likely to die prematurely from cardiovascular disease, um, and that's not talking about their quality of life before their death. There are also persisting unfair differences between different ethnicities and races and um, with precise relationships varying across the different localities. It's for this reason that hypertension, smoking and lipids are one of the are three of the core areas of the core 20 plus 5 approach. I thought it was important to start with the contextual factors as healthcare doesn't exist in a vacuum. And there's often a complex interplay between what we do, society, politics, economics, and history. While our observed performance is probably due to our high levels of, of deprivation and likely is, one could still argue it could be reflective of a lack of responsiveness to meet the actual or underlying needs of the people we're seeing each day. For me, the appreciation of this complexity an overlap between classically clinical pathways, wider social and demographic factors, medicine and public health is the key to not just CVD prevention, but for improving the whole of the healthcare system while lowering costs and improving outcomes. And combined with a systems and complexity informed approach really forms a basis for our direction of travel in GM. The main value add that I see if this work is one of alignment and coordination across the whole system, connecting the dots between promoting disease-focused clinical excellence while facilitating better individualized, personalized care, for example, while all being encapsulated within a population health approach and one that works for people, both citizens and us and our workforce too. We've known about CVD and inequalities for a long time, but we're still in the place we are today. At this stage, I don't think this is just a primary care or secondary care problem, but it's a whole system issue, as signified by premature death rates rising for the first time in 50 years. I'm sure we've all at times felt like the people at the top and the ones at the bottom, although this is ultimately now all of our problems, and only together can we hope to lead to the change we're all striving for. Um, the current iteration of our GM CVD plan was adapted from the national priorities um, in co-production with Greater Manchester and adapted for GM and takes a whole systems complexity informed approach. The plan really starts to lay some of the foundations to start to put system level structures um, and governance in place while also making some imminent recommendations in addition to new quality standards. The quality standards initially encompassing the core clinical processes of ABCs, um, AF, blood pressure and cholesterol, as clinical effectiveness is really a core prerequisite to quality of care. These are standards for the system and not just for any part of it, uh, such as general practice or secondary care. It's easy to find best practice guidelines, um, whereas these are about the minimum standard to which we all agree that we hold ourselves account to, so that we can start to minimize the variation and improve inequities across the system, and the ICS being accountable for that. 
considering the cross-cutting complexity within the field. Um, the plan's based around a general ethos or principles to allow for flexibility, uh, with the first two relating more to the system slash ICS level and the latter two uh, closer to the ground and front line. Clinically speaking, the priority has to be on hypertension for all of the reasons uh, Dr. Kearney had mentioned, due to the incredibly strong evidence base for controlling blood pressure in reducing incidence and prevalence of CVD, the strong link with inequalities and the measured disruption in our performance over the last two years. While I know the classical health check can be contentious, we do need to start to increase systematic detection in a way that works for us, such as focusing on the high risk and those with the most to gain, while starting to do opportunistic screening across healthcare settings, let alone the community. This is why we haven't called it health checks, but systematic detection. Doesn't matter how we find the people, we just need to get to where the people, where the need is. Um, and as Dr. Kearney mentioned, the, our understanding of cholesterol has significantly improved. Um, as of last year, only 25% of our high-risk uh, cardiovascular cohort had their cholesterols within recommended levels. I'm a bottom-up type of person, but clearly we will need to use both bottom-up and top-down mechanisms in order for us to affect the change we are all striving for. To that end, I'm extremely grateful that we've all assembled here today um, and looking forward to working with all of you collaboratively going forward. I'm grateful we have the support of Dr. Manisha Kumar, our Chief Medical Officer, and we've since set up an ICS level CVD prevention oversight group, which she chairs. Um, she is fully supportive and backing of this work, and this is one of her four priorities for the Greater Manchester Integrated Care System over the next few years. Data is a really cross-cutting theme, and how we operationalise data into intelligence in a way that makes sense to the front line is critical in enabling and embedding quality improvement and health, improve, health inequalities related work and improvements. Uh, to that end, we've been working really collaboratively with the BI, data quality teams, Health Innovation Manchester, in really scoping it out. Um, it's often more complicated and involves a lot more steps, but I'm excited to show you some of the things that we've been working on um, in the background. Uh, the next few slides follow on from a hack day that we had um, a few weeks ago, where we had a great collection of people from public health, consultants, from primary care, from BI, from data quality teams, from Health Innovation Manchester, to really dive into the problem of data, uh, what we can do now, what we can't do now, and where we want to be at. Um, I'm excited to say that uh, Greater Manchester is the first integrated care system, as far as I know. Um, I could be wrong, um, but this is what I've been told that we are the first ICS to be going for approval for secondary use of data for each citizen in Greater Manchester. Currently, these approvals exist for the Manchester locality. So the dashboard I'm going to show you has been kind of worked up, tested there. Once the approval is done in a few weeks' time, this should be accessible to everyone across Greater Manchester. Um, this is just the start of our understanding this tool and technology and what we can do with it. So this is very alpha and pilot kind of, kind of work. Um, I think, Dr. Kearney, we've been working on a, on a similar problem in different places and different ways. And uh, I've, we've all learned a huge amount from your work and the UCL Partners frameworks. They are on all the, all the general practice computers already and have been for as long as as long as they were released. Um, I really wanted to try and help support the, the person-centred care. We see people with multiple illnesses. And so similar to you, we've combined how poorly people are managed across multiple illnesses into one score um, or number to help that prioritisation. It's called the CV need number for unmet need. Um, this is the kind of data and level of data that we will be able to get access to in a few weeks. 
Um, so you can then start to even build in the clinical pathways. Uh, this is a person from Manchester, and you can see all their risk stratification, their latest clinical results, and it even tells you what medication they should be on or consider um, across all of their illnesses. Of course, this all aligns to our custom Greater Manchester pathways, the, the tools and incentives and where, where we're trying to get to. You can then break this data down however you want to, by ethnicity, by blood pressure, by CKD. Um, we've got some confidence intervals because it's good to know, uh, be a bit more certain about how we make decisions going forwards. Finally, we can see where these people are. This is the Manchester locality. Um, it's one of the, the most deprived localities in Greater Manchester, which is one of the most deprived in England. As you can see, you off, we off, whenever we map things, and especially deprivation, we often get everywhere is red or yellow. Once we now combine the prioritization across the illnesses, we can see these are about seven or eight streets this is data from the primary care record overlaid over the people's postcodes. So once the system is truly integrated, it's clear where you would send those resources. Of course, it is a complex problem and, and we need to keep pushing up the baseline. And of course, clinical guidelines, standardization is extremely important. Uh, we adapted the national AAC guideline last year uh, for secondary prevention of cholesterol. We're hopefully just about to release our new blood pressure guideline um, next week or in the next two weeks once approved by GMMG. Uh, both of these are designed to make the right thing the easiest thing to do in any situation. Um, the hypertension one starts to integrate things like community pharmacy, home blood pressure monitoring, trying to get as much useful things in one place for our practitioners as possible. Of course, medication is only a small part of that overall problem. In my opinion, it's the processes we're falling down on and helping them to run smoother from start to finish is our aim. Um, we're working across the kind of from improving detection uh, through all the way to rehab and how we can better support individuals getting back into routine life um, as well. The final pillar is the, the public patient engagement, education, and it's so important. Um, a lot of my pre presentation today was really aimed at trying to, to share some of my understanding and some of the complexities of, that we now have to deal with. Uh, people are the best thing in the NHS, in my opinion, and it's time we really thought seriously about their education and training. I'm really grateful that the Stroke Network will be leading this on, uh, on behalf of the Greater Manchester ICS, to help bring this together. Um, that we have so much excellent work going on across Greater Manchester, um, in all ten localities, all three million people, um, and it's really to try and bring this together to make it easier to access for people when they need it. Um, we have large communities of different ethnicities in GM, and it's imperative we appropriately engage the public and the people we see in order to actually reduce those inequalities. To that end, Stroke Network and Farin has already been doing some amazing work with the British Muslim Heritage Centre um, on a train the trainer scheme, and we're hoping to, to collaborate with the GM ICS Equality, Diversity and in Inclusion team to look into supporting this further on a systemic level uh, as well. So one of the main issues, I think, um, with CVD prevention is the high level of complexity and far-reaching scope covering different areas of the traditionally siloed system. This means there's a lot of duplication, fragmentation, which leads to confusion, missed opportunities for people and inefficiencies, for want of a better word, for the system. I think the vaccination drive clearly demonstrated to me just how much we can achieve when we focus and perhaps break some of the rules. And I'm certain that we can change this and in our lifetimes, but it will require us to both work differently going forwards while also with a concerted system-wide effort, with everyone taking some responsibility for their part of the system, which is partly why we are all here today. 
um, as well. I think the real key will be in connecting those many dots across classically clinical and non-clinical areas while better aligning all those services, people and activities to lead to that single cohesive system and one that's actually greater than the sum of its parts. So thank you very much for listening. I just wondered whether um, the health improvement practitioners are kind of involved in, in this work. So obviously in Bolton we've got our health improvement practitioner service and they aim to do all of, of the things that you've been talking about. So it was just a kind of, I, I wondered um, how they were involved. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, they are involved because of the 10 localities there is a lot of different names for people doing similar roles and, and places. Um, so part of the CVD toolkit we're releasing is in conjunction with the uh, lead for the R's roles, social prescribing roles. Um, we're releasing also a one-pager on behavioral, kind of how to talk to people meaningfully about their health. I think we've heard elements of that through some of the talks earlier today, um, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, all of our meetings are open, anyone can attend, they're all recorded, they're all shared. We're really trying to get everyone involved, so if, if you would like to, please do come along. Um, our oversight group is represented by the associate medical director of each of the localities, and through them, that's how we kind of we connect into what's going on more locally. Um, so, absolutely. Any other questions? Um, those are great talks. Thank you very much. And I think um, um, I think we've realised for a while that we need to do better. Um, I oh, was just wondering in terms of obviously the, the folk in the room here are generally stroke um, clinicians and are mainly sat in community services or hospital services. What, a lot of what we've talked about is around pri primary care and we know how busy they are. I just wonder what the opportunity is for, for um, stroke or um, a, a stroke community to work more collaboratively with primary care to kind of help achieve some of these things because obviously secondary prevention the risks are even greater, the risks are even higher in that, that group of patients. So I don't know whether to hand it over to you, Matt, to answer first. Yeah, definitely. Um, it has to, be, um, has, has to be collaborative. And there is, a lot, there is lots of collaboration. I'm sure there's loads of great collaboration going on at the moment. I suppose from our perspective, it's, it's really critical to acknowledge this is really difficult. This is not going to be solved by just sort of transactional stuff of some more meetings, some more collaborative exercises, some more projects. It has to be transformative and, it, and acknowledging that it's really hard for primary care. So it's not just supporting with sort of knowledge transfer to primary care, for example, um, or supporting multidisciplinary clinics, but actually helping to work through as a system how can we do things very, very differently. And we all, yes, I agree. I mean, it's, this is not just for primary care. Across the whole pathway, we have to be part of that. But of course, a, a lot of the opportunities for optimising blood pressure or um, lipid management or AF detection lie in secondary care and elsewhere and all those other contacts that patients have. And generally, there are very poor pathways between those secondary care encounters and getting some management in primary care. So, yes, it's not just about sorting primary care, but so several elements there, but I, I don't know if you want to... No, I thought that was really well answered, but I just wanted to add that um, you know, I talk to a lot of different people in GM of different backgrounds, and I think you all really get it. I need your help to explain to others, you know, your understanding and your realities of, of, of caring for individuals following such a significant event is really powerful. And other people don't quite understand CVD in the same way. 
Um, so that's something that, that something little that I, I need your, all of your help with. Sarah, I maybe have a bit of an answer to that as well. Um, I'm over here. We've, we've just appointed a health improvement practitioner into our community neuro rehab team. It's, on a, it's a kind of trial. I, I, can't, I don't know how long it's for, but it's specifically to look at um, things around behaviour change and how we can support our patients to kind of engage, not just with our therapy, but any behaviour change that might improve their health. So it might be worth us having a chat about it. before we carry on. Well, thanks again um, to Dr. Kearney, Dr. Boyd and...